this afternoon is Omar Al Khazali, and uh, he took with me discrete math, and he took also math with maybe is taking now with Tahir, and maybe with others. And uh, I don't want to like talk too much about him, uh, but he is really uh, like uh, what I what we look for in the math department. He loved, uh, he has love and passion to mathematics. He's uh, in uh, engineering, but he declared another major in math. And uh, maybe if, you know, with time, I, I see he's going to have a bright future in mathematics. My prediction, my only prediction, I hope I will be correct. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Dr. Ayman, to Dr. Christian, and the math department for allowing me to do this. Now, first of all, I would like to see a show of hands. Who does not know what a graph is? Not your classical graph as uh, like x squared, y equals x squared, but a graph as a discrete structure with dots and lines between. OK, good. So I will first assume that you have some knowledge of graph theory. And as you've seen from the title, the title says it's uh, about a tree. So now the question is, what is a tree? No, I, no, I'm sorry, am I recording? Yes. Okay. So a tree is a graph with a unique path between every pair of vertices. So first we have gamma with a vertex set, an edge set, and a relation. So in this tree, for example, let's take this tree as an example. This is a tree because between every pair of vertices, there is only one way, one path to get to them. So between 1 and 3, I have to move from 1 to 2 to 3. And likewise for every other pair of vertices. But now if I want to change this so that it's not a tree, I do this and now it becomes a cycle. So you could think of as a, uh, a, you could think of a tree as uh, graphs without cycles. That's the first. But now when I mention a path, what is the rigorous definition of a path? We see that a path can be defined in two ways. One way is by using the vertices. Another way is by using the edges. So in this case, we'll be using the edges. So we define the path, small gamma, as a relation, or as an ordered as pair, where we have vertex 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 3 to 1. If you ever have a path where the first vertex and the last vertex are the same, that is a cycle. So in this case, we will not be considering this sort of graph. We will only be considering ordered pairs where there are no uh, there are no duplicate edges. So in this in a path, you can never go back to the same edge. I can go from one to two, but I cannot go back from two to one unless it is a cycle. So for our case, we will only be considering trees, and that's why we only have um, uh, non-duplicate uh, edges. Now, I will also have to define what an adjacency matrix is. Now, the question is, how can we define this numerically? We can think of it and look at it um, visually, but now, numerically, how do we define it? We take a transformation, A, of gamma, where gamma is the graph, and every element i, j of that matrix can be defined as, as the value 1 if uh, the vertex i and vertex j are connected in the graph, and zero otherwise. So let's take an example. I will take the example. Here is one graph. I will label them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If I want to take the adjacency matrix of this graph, I will get the matrix 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, and all ones here, and then zeros on here. You could think of it as a table 
when I label each of these vertices here, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And then if one and two are connected, as we can see here, they are connected, so there is a value one. And now if we look at, for instance, two and four, two and four are not connected, so they have a value zero. By an edge. Yes, by an edge. So the edges, of, and maybe I should make it clear that the edges here are the lines between every pair of vertices. So we define an edge by uh, this relation where we have some vertex V related to some vertex U. And if this is in the edge set, then this is an edge in the graph. So over here, vertex 2 is not does not have an edge with vertex 3. So therefore, 2 is not connected to 3. Now that we define the adjacency matrix, um, I would like to define what a walk is. A walk is very similar to a path. However, there's less restrictions on it. In the path, we said that we cannot have any duplicates. However, with a walk, you can have as many duplicates as you want. There is no problem with having with going from one to two, back to one to three, and then back to one and two. So in this case, this is a, a path for this cycle. But if we take this three, here's a path. I take one to two. I should start from two, actually. Two to one, and then one to five. So this is a path. And I cannot change this. I cannot go back from five to one because I've already visit, visited one once before. However, if I take a walk W, I can go from two to one, one to five, five to one, and one to four. So this is a walk, that's completely fine. Now I will define uh, a lemma, a lemma that, will, that we will need. And this lemma says, the number of walks of length n from vertices i to j is the entry i j of the matrix to the power of n. So if I take the adjacency matrix a of gamma to the power of n, every element i j is equal to the number of walks of length n from v i to v j. I will not be defining the proof of this lemma because it is already known. However, if you are interested, we can show you after the top. Um, and now let's take an example of this. So I have this adjacency matrix. Let me take it to a square. I just take A of gamma squared. So what is this equals to? This will be four, all zeros here, all zeros here. And I will have ones all across in the middle. Now, what does this mean? This means that to go, for, a, for instance, from 3 to 2, how many walks of length 2 do I have? Clearly, I have 1, because I can only go from 1 to 2. So there's, I cannot go any further. So therefore, the walk is defined as 3 to 1, 1 to 2, and that's it. I cannot go any further. So that's the, the length is the number of edges in the ordered pair. Now, if we take, for example, a of gamma to the power of 3, I also get the matrix 0, 4, all across, and all zeros here. Now, again, what does this mean? If I go from vertex 1 to 2, how many walks of length three do I have? I can go one, two, three, that's one. One, two, three, that's another. One, two, three, one, two, three. So in total, I have four walks. And that is the entry ij in this matrix. So now we will use this lemma. But first, we have to. Um, we have to have a, the definition of what I call a Booleanized matrix. So I have this lemma here. But for us to understand it further for the purposes of the theorem, 
we will take a transformation data that takes in a matrix of size n by n and gives you back the same size matrix n by n. And how is this defined? Rigorously, it is defined as if I take B of Q, so matrix Q, every entry ij is the minimum of 1 and the entry at Q. So what does this actually mean? It basically means you go through every element of the of the matrix. You see, is it 0 or 1? If it is, read it. If it is not 0 or 1, make it 1. So if I take this matrix and I perform this transformation on it, data of A, Q, I will have 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, and then all 1's here. So that's your new matrix. Now, what does this actually show? It shows the existence of a path. So if I have this walk here, from this walk from 3 to 4, and I take A of gamma squared, how many walks of length 2 do I have? I have 1, 2, and that's it. So now I know because there is a walk, there is also a path there. Because the walk is less restrictive than the path, Therefore, if there exists a walk that goes from 3 to 1 and 1 to 2, then there must be a path that can go through there as well. Because at least one of the walks will have no duplicates. Okay. Now we know that transformation. And it's a very simple algorithm to perform this. It's your standard two loops. I'll write it here. For i goes from 0 to n minus 1, and j goes from 0 to uh, n minus 1 as well. We say if qij equal, is greater than 1, then qij is equals to 1. And now you transform the matrix. Very simple. You could do it in programming 1. So now that we know this, I'll state to you the result. Now the result I have, should probably move this. Here's the result. I claim the following are equivalent. So this is an if and only if condition. Number one, the longest path of a tree gamma is n. This is the value n, where m is an integer. Number two, beta of a of gamma to the m plus one is equal to beta of a of gamma to m minus one for minimum such m. Basically, you look at all of it, the powers of these graphs, Booleanized, and you see which one is the, the minimum one, that I claim that that minimum one is the longest path. Now, I have to prove it to you. First of all, because this is an if and only if condition, I have to prove to you both ways. The first way is proving one. We already know that the longest path of length m so I have a tree, some tree. I know I will denote the longest path as d of diameter of gamma is equal to m. So I already know that there will not be any paths of length m plus 1. There can never exist any paths of length m plus 1. So because there doesn't exist any paths of length m plus 1, if we take a of gamma to the power of m plus 1, Boolean I. What does that tell you? Just like what we saw here, the Booleanization of the matrix shows you the existence of a path. So if I already showed you all of the existences of the paths of lengths n, then I must show you also n minus 2, n minus 4, and so on. Why is that? Because if I take some, some graph, I take the same example I showed you in the beginning. I go from 1 to 2 and 3. 
I'm going to go from 1 to 2 and back to 1. So that's a path of length 2. So what if I have um, a walk of length 4? I can go 1, 2, 3, 4. That's the same walk. I'm going back to 1. Or for instance, I want to go to 2. I have a, path, a walk of length 1, 1 to 2, and that's it. What about a walk of length 3? I can go 1, 2, 3. So what we see here is for every matrix with walks of length m, you also have the walks of length n minus 2, n minus 4, and so on. So what does that actually mean? It means that for a matrix with a booleanization, you will get the paths from n mod 2, n mod 2, plus 2, and you keep incrementing plus 2 all the way to n. The reason why we have n mod 2 is because there is a disjoint set between all of the ones that are even and all of the ones that are common. So if I have this matrix here, it's all of the walks of length 2. But if you notice, the diagonal elements are also non-zero. And when we think of it, how can an adjacency matrix have diagonal elements non-zero? That's because if I have a walk, I can go from 1 to 2 back to 1. So 1 went back to itself. So that is known as a self-loop. I'm sure you guys in computer science have seen it before. So that's why we have self-loops in A of gamma squared. And if I take A of gamma to the power of 4, I will very interestingly get the value 16, all zeros, all zeros here, and all fours here. So what's interesting is this after Booleanization is the same thing. So I reduce this to 1. Every value that is greater than 1 is reduced to 1. This becomes 1. All of these become 1. This is exactly the same matrix as that. So after you Booleanize it, you notice that a to the power of 4 is the same as a to the power of 2. In fact, if I do that to a to the power of 3, what do we get? We get a to the power of 1. So a to the power of 3 is equal to a to the power of 1, but a to the power of 2 is not equal to a to the power of 0. So with this theorem, if we take this as true, that means a to the power of 3, which is m plus 1, is equal to a to the power of 1. So m is equal to 2. And what do we see here? The longest path is 2. I can only go from 3 to 5, or 3 to 4, 3 to 2, and so on. I can never get the path longer than 2. But to get back to the proof, now since we know that we have multiples of 2, the only time that this can be true is if it is equal to a of gamma to the power of n minus 1. Not n, because that would be, if this is odd, this would be n would be even. If n plus 1 is even, then that n would be odd. So you have to compare to the ones that are the same. Now that we know this, it is necessary, if and only if, that if you have a longest path of length m, then the number of walks, booleanized, of length m plus 1 would be equal to the ones length m minus 1. Why? Because if I go here, I have one uh, walk of length 1. And a walk of length 3 will also be able to give me the same thing. A walk of length 5 will give me the same thing. So these are necessary to have. And if we think of it, let us take A of gamma squared, but we will have a relation where we will join every one of them that are conjoined. So for example, I have a walk of length 2 here. That means in my new matrix, A of gamma squared, this will look like this. Because I'm only joining the ones that are connected to it. And if you notice, this one from 2 does not have any paths of length 2. So it is not connected to anything. So we take that result from the Booleanization. And we show that m plus 1 has to equal to m minus 1 if m is the longest path.
clearly, because m is the longest path, it implies that a, the boolearization of a of gamma to the m plus 1 is equal to a boolearization of a of gamma to the m minus 1. So we proved 1 to 2. It's clear. Because as seen from the example, and over here, clearly if you have no paths longer than m, then it has to be the same as something else because it would not generate anything new. Now I have to prove to you 2 implies 1. First thing I have to assume is I have to assume that they are equal. Let A of gamma to the m plus 1 equal to the boolearized A of gamma to the m minus 1, where n is the minimum such number. We also have to assume M is not the longest path. I'm denying it. I deny the fact that this is the longest path. But let me continue here. I deny it. Let K be the longest path. Plane of gamma. Let K not equal to M. I'm denying that it is the longest path. By the result from 1, we already know if K is the longest path, that means the beta of A to the A of gamma to the K plus 1 is equal to beta of A of gamma to the M minus 1. We already showed that K, sorry, this has to be K, k plus 1, k minus 1. We already showed from 1 here that this has to be the minimum such number. The only case where you can have a longest path um, where you take a of gamma to the k plus 1 equals to a of gamma to the k minus 1 is when k is the minimum such number. So by that, k is the minimum number that satisfies this property. But what did we assume? We assume that m is the minimum and m is not the longest path. But we just showed that k has to equal to m. But we assume that k is not equal to m. Therefore, this is false, and our assumption was wrong. We proved by contradiction that it has to be the longest path. So therefore, n is the longest path. So by this theorem, let's summarize. We first claim that the longest path of a tree is n, and the boolearization of a of gamma to the m plus 1 equals to the boolearization of a of gamma to the m minus 1 for the minimum n that satisfies that number. We prove 1 to 2. The beta of a of gamma to the m plus 1 equals the beta of a, a of gamma to the m minus 1 if m is the longest path. Why? Because you cannot have any paths longer than this. So for instance, if you take this graph, we took it to the power of 2 and we got this graph. But what if we take it to the power of 3? If we take it to the power of 3, all we get is the walks of length 1. These graphs are isomorphic. This is to the power of 3. This is to the power of 1. If they are isomorphic, then you take it to minus 1, 3 minus 1, 2. This is the longest path. And in fact, if you take A of gamma, beta of A of gamma to the k plus 1, minus beta of A of gamma to the k minus 1. If this is equal to 0, this is clearly true, because we're just moving this, this side, this from the right side to the left. And this is equal to 0, and 3 is if, and the only if k is the longest or greater. So I could say, reform this formulation, and say that the beta 
of a of gamma to the n plus one is equals to beta of a of gamma to the n minus one if and only if n is greater than or equals to the true longest path of gamma. So clearly, if you take minimum such number, you will get the diameter or the longest path of gamma. So now that we formulated it like this, how do we know the actual values, the actual um, vertices that are connected? Because clearly, if I take the boolearization, this is just giving me the first, the first name. Now, how will I know which ones are connected? The easiest way is just take beta of a of gamma to the longest path, take it to the power of the longest path, negate it by beta of a of gamma to the power of the longest path minus two. And this will give me a matrix, some matrix with some unknown values. But if you take the subtraction of these two, the only thing that you will be left with is all of the paths of length of the longest path. Why? Because we already mentioned that if you have a path of length n in A of gamma to the n, then you must have n minus 2, n minus 4, and so on. So if you remove all of n minus 2, n minus 4, and so on, you will only be left with n. And those are the only values in the matrix that you have left. Therefore, you will get some matrix. Um, where you will have some zeros, some ones, and you know that wherever you have ones, those are the ones that are the ones. For instance, in this case, if I take A of gamma to the power of 3 and minus A of gamma to the power of 1, these are isomorphic. However, if I take A of gamma to the power of 2 minus A of gamma to the power of 0, it will just be minus the identity which means I will only be left with the terms that are here. So wherever you can see these connections, those are the actual vertices that are connected that give you the longest path. So we take this example. We see here, from 2, we have 3. 2 to 3, that's 1, 2. That's 2. Uh, 4 to 5. 1, 2, 4 to 2, 1, 2. It's all here. So if you take this simple subtraction, you know exactly what the longest path's length is, and you know the exact set of vertices that give you that longest path. What I like about this method over Dijkstra's algorithm is that Dijkstra's algorithm gives you the, long, the first longest path it gives you. It will continue searching, 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 but as soon as it finds the longest path, it will just give you whatever it had in memory. But because this is a mathematical structure and a matrix that's representing the whole graph, you can get every pair of that length. And this is true not only for the longest path, you can also do it for values less than. Because if you assume n is less than the longest path, and take beta of a of gamma to the n minus beta of a of gamma to the n minus 2, this will give you some matrix. Well, now you get just get the paths of length n. So those are the ones that are connected, and those are the ones that you might be interested in. Now the question is, how can we use it? Okay. Why, why are we using it? For this, there are some many interesting applications, as I'm sure you know, of GraphQA. However, what I will be showing you today is what we call a verification of systems in computer science. For example, let's say that you have a set of processors, processor one, processor two. You have a set of tasks. The tasks can be anything, multiplication, addition, subtraction, anything. Or it doesn't even need to be simple. It can be more complex, matrix multiplication, anything that you can visualize as a task. These tasks are dependent on each other. A lot of the time, you cannot compute something unless you have some other value. 
So that is a dependency. So I have these tasks, and I have a dependency on each of them. For example, one uh, one that you could think of is two times three uh, to the power of four divided by seven. So you already know that you have to compute what is in the parentheses. And you can only compute what's in the parentheses first, and then take it to the power of four. You cannot do it otherwise, unless you want worse computation. And then you also have to take it to the division after you're done with the power. So these are a set of tasks that are dependent on each other. And that can be represented by a graph, a directed asymptotic graph, where all of them are dependent on each other, and this is the flow of time. Now the question is, what is the maximum number of operations I can give to one processor? How many operations can I give to just one processor so that I can evaluate its worst possible computation? If I have a very weak processor, processor one, let's say, is very weak, and processor two is a bit stronger than processor one. But processor two might be weak in multiplication, while my processor one is better in multiplication, However, processor one is worse than everything else. So now the question is, how can I assign all of these tasks to these processors in the way where I can compute this in the minimum capacity? Now, for you to analyze that, the, what I find is you can take this as a graph, directed acyclic graph. You will have it be um, non-symmetric because it's directed. And if you take this to the power of gamma and take uh, to the power of n and take it up to the longest path, you will find that it will give you the maximum number of tasks that you can give to one processor that, with that dependency. So for example, if I give you uh, a smaller example than this, this will be a two larger than I will have six vertices of uh, task one, two, three, four, five, and six. And I have this dependency. If I may ask anyone to open up matrixcap.org, just open up matrixcap.org so we can have a good computation of this. We first have to build the matrix. So one is connected to two and nothing else. So I can write immediately 0, 1, and then zeros everywhere else. 1, 2, 3, 4, And then 2 is connected to 3. So only that. 4 is connected to 2 and 5. So I have 0, 0, 0. Uh, this has to be 1. And it's connected to 5 here. Then 6. This is 3. So 3 is not connected to anything. 4 is connected to 2 and 5. 5 is connected to 6, and 6 is connected to nothing. So if we verify, 1 is connected to 2, 2 is connected to 3, 4 is connected to uh, 2 and 5, that's true. 5 is connected to 6, and 6 is connected to nothing. Okay, so that's our graph. Take this matrix to the power of 2. What's the value, if anyone can come I can, I already know that the structure would be you would have paths of length two connected. So one would be connected to three. Four will be connected to three. A four will be connected to six. And that's it. So this is the graph that you get if you take it to the power of two, ignoring self loops. Of course, over here we don't have any self loops because this is a directed graph. And now, if you take it to the power of three, you're going to get. Yeah. 
you're going to get all of the paths of length 3. So now if we have paths of length 3, this is 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. So you don't have any of length 3. Your graph will be empty. And why is that? If we look back at the lemma that shows the, the theorem for the walks, if this is directed, there is no way for me to go back to 1. So you will eventually get to the, the matrix 0. So for directed asymptotic graphs, you have exactly the same theorem, except you will get 0 in the end. You don't even have to compare it to i minus 2. So once you get to this value, you know that this value minus 1, 3 minus 1, will be the longest path, 2, which is true in this case. 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. So you know that the maximum number of paths that you can give to one processor that are dependent on each other in this case is 2. And now you can evaluate how fast or how slow the computation can be for that one. Now, I want to also show you how you can compute this as an algorithm. So, for all of the computer science students here, clearly we're using matrix multiplication. But can anyone tell me what is the, the asymptotic complexity of matrix multiplication? O of, o of what? O of n squared? Square? Q. Q. It's O of n Q. But in fact, this is the naive algorithm. The algorithm that we've been taught since our first year has always been three for loops with one formula where you're just summing and multiplying. However, there are far better algorithms. Currently, the best algorithm was found in just a couple of days ago in October of 2022 by, sorry if I butcher the names, Duan, Wu, and Zhao, they have a complexity of n to the power of 2.37188. In fact, it's a funny story because uh, a few days before they got this complexity, uh, an AI actually found a better algorithm than what we currently know. It reduced the bound by 0 0.0001 from this. And before this, Josh Allen had the complexity 2.378596. So in fact, they only reduced the bound by a factor of 0 0.0009796. A very small bound, but it's worthwhile with high dimensional matrices. And I will first show you the algorithm. So what is the algorithm to compute the longest path? The algorithm can be found by two different ways. One is an iterative naive way. Another is a more complicated logarithmic way. So it's a very simple two-liner on Python. I'm sure you can do it. For i goes from 2 to the, the cardinality of the vertex set, which just means the number of vertices. If a the, the boolearized a of gamma to the power of i equals to the boolearized a of gamma to the power of i minus 2, then it return i minus 1. And what does this mean? Just like what we saw before, this is to the power of 1, to the power of 2, but to the power of 3 is exactly the same as to the power of 2, uh, sorry, to the power of 1. So 3 is the same as 1, therefore 3 minus 1 is 2, therefore 2 is the longest path. So it follows that this is true if this is proven correct because we already proved the theorem and this does, does exactly what the theorem does. If we try and calculate the asymptotic complexity for this, I use theta here for a, a Python bound. Theta of P, where P is the polynomial complexity of the matrix algorithm that you decide to use. In this case, obviously, the best bound would be U. However, it, is, it also depends on your implementation. P times the summation from i equals to 1. We take 1 in this case because remember, if you have to compute i, you also have to compute i minus 2. So only when we get to 3, we also power, take it to the power of 1. So we actually go from 1 all the way to the 
to n. Over here, I'm defining n as the cardinality of the vertex set, just the number of vertices. And this is just the number of operations. You will just find that this is theta of t times n. This is the worst case scenario. And if you take the best bound that we have now, this would be theta of n to the 3.37188. However, this is a simple linearly iterative algorithm. It's a funny story because this a new algorithm that I'm about to show you, I found just on the bus today morning. Because when you think of it, if you have the values 0, 1, to all the way to k, where k is your longest path, why do you need to compute all of these all the way down to k? What if you can just skip a lot of them? Not all of them, but a lot of them until you find which one can actually be k. Then you can make it less than iterative, less than linear. So I'll show you this algorithm now. In fact, it's a little bit complicated. So we'll take it step by step. There is one that could be defined recursively and one that could be defined iteratively. Right now, I will show you the iterative algorithm because obviously recursive algorithms can have some uh, computational terms. Like in, in uh, so I take for i it goes from two. I'll be defining it like in Z plus plus. I is less than or equals to the cardinality of the vertex set. And I becomes two times I. So a lot of you already know what the, the new bound will be. While this is iterating, I have if beta of A of gamma to the I is equals to beta of A of gamma to the I minus 2, then what do I do? Over here, you might have a problem. What if you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 16? What if your longest path is actually 7? Or rather than 7, what if it's 9? If it's 9, I go, I start at 2, then I go to 4, I go to 8, it's not equal to. Still not yet because it has to be 10 equals to uh, 10 equals to 8. But then after after 8, I'll go straight to 16. 16, it is equals to 14. Because over here we have the case that this is true if and only if n is greater than or equals to b of gamma. So now I have to have some way where I can find it in between these two bounds. And that's exactly what this more complicated section is doing. So while beta of A of gamma to the I is equal to beta of A of gamma to the I minus 2, while this is true, I take a new variable J and I assign it to I. And now I update I. I becomes I plus 2 the power of log base 2 of i ceiling minus 1. And what is this? What, what does this mean? This, this just means if I went to 16, I have to know what my previous bound was. Because over here, I'm computing them by powers of 2. Now I just have to go back. What was my latest iteration? I don't want to have more space complexity. And we know that this is easy to compute. So this will just give me the previous 2 to the i. So if I have 2 to the i here, I'll get 2 to the i minus 1 here. Log of base 2 of i ceiling is just there because once you're updating, you might not have uh, an integer value for this uh, logarithm. And we take this divided by 2. What does this actually do? It takes, if I have the value 8 here and the value 16 there, I take 8 plus 16 divided by 2 and I go there. Just like in the binary search tree or in binary search algorithm. So once I take that, I keep on updating up until I find the case where they are not equal. So now i goes all the way back to 8 or 9. 
So once we go to nine, nine is not equal to seven. We know that much because nine is the, the longest path, therefore it must be 10 equals to eight. So if nine is not equal to seven, then I break out of this loop and I have another one. It becomes y i is not j plus one. If beta of a of gamma to the i plus j over two is equal to beta of a of gamma to the i plus j over two minus two, then I update j. J becomes the average between. So if you think of it, I have this going on. So I go and start from zero. I go all the way here to some value, maybe 32. And now the previous one before 32 was 16. So now I know that these, the, the value is somewhere in here. I don't know exactly where, but now I have to converge to it. How do I converge to it? I take the average between them. This average, if it is, let's say that the longest path is here. If it is less than, then I have to update this value so I can get closer to it, just like an optimization. So if the value is here, I'm updating i. If the value is before the average here, I'm updating j to be closer to i. So that's all that this is. Otherwise, if this is not true, then again, I update i. Once I'm done with this y loop, you will have the case where i is right on the longest path and j is the longest path plus one. You will have j is 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 equals to j minus two and i is not equals to i minus two. And you know that i has to be the longest path. This converges for sure. After this, once you're done with this loop, you return i. Otherwise, if all of this doesn't work, it means you don't have a cube. You return minus one, which is the other factor. And this algorithm now reduces the bound as of this morning from theta of p times n to theta of p times the log of base two of n plus some residue factors of log of base two of log of base two of n plus another residue factor with some constant of log of base two log of base two of n that is also dependent on i and j. So this bound is far better than this because then you don't have to compute that many matrix multiplications all the way from zero to the longest path. And in fact, you could customize this algorithm to however you want. That's what's so nice about this, because it's a theorem, you know exactly where you have to converge. So if you know that your graphs in your special case or in your application generally has longest paths closer to the, the vertex, uh, the number of vertices, then why start from zero? Start from the number of vertices and go backwards. Or if you know that it's in the middle, then you start from the middle, and so on. So you could do it by the same technique in binary search trees and have the same result for faster computation. Faster best case scenario and for the same uh, worst case scenario. If you don't know your, what your, uh, what your graph is like. And in fact, the only time where we will actually have this term equals to n is if you have this graph, a straight line. If this is your graph, there is no need to analyze it. If you already know that what your graph is going to be, and you already know the structure of this graph, therefore, if you have n vertices, then your longest path is n minus one. And you already know where you're starting and where you're ending. So you will never realistically get to the worst case scenario. You will, you will get to a point of isomorphism or a point where they are equal. So you, I would prefer to write it as p times k, where k is your isomorph, isomorphism. And by this, this is the naive algorithm, and then the, the not naive algorithm will just replace n by k. In fact, 
um, we go up with factors of two in this algorithm, but nothing is stopping you from going up with factors of three or five. So if you already know that your longest path is going to be really close to the vertex, but you cannot start from the, from the vertex number for some reason, you have to start from zero, then you don't need to multiply by two, you can multiply by three, multiply by four, and then you then get to some objective function that you want to minimize. How much time to finish that? Yes. So we take f of n is equals to whatever complexity you have there, d into log of base 2 of base x of n plus the residue factor. You can play around with x and get your best log. It depends on your application, but then you just have some sort of uh, objective function that you're trying to minimize over some uh, over some domain with n being your the, the base of the logarithm, and then you can optimize your algorithm for whatever use case you want. I can take any questions now. If you like. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, from mathematical point of view, let me ask, why did I ask the user talk from a mathematical point of view? For me. Of course, as usual, whenever you see a theorem and when you know the proof, you think, oh, that's... But the process of thinking, I think, being a mathematician, this is not a trivia to think of what we call it the boolean to get to that theorem. The idea how we, you know, reduce the matrix like to take A to some power and we make the non-zero numbers uh, change them to one. This is for me, as a mathematician, is not a trivial thinking. And at the beginning, maybe you will wonder what is doing that. So the idea, and that's what we always look at these things in mathematics. As soon as you get there, then maybe you know. So for me, what I like, I don't know what your algorithm is, <laughs> but for me, I really love the idea. The idea is beautiful. I agree with Dr. In fact, I hope so. <laughs> In fact, I, I, we already have a result on, on the number of blocks, but to get to the stage where you're thinking, well, this matrix looks like this one, but how can I, what conclusions can I get from here? I cannot tell you how I got to this. It's just an observation that comes up. However, you do notice these things. And you see that once you reduce them, like how Dr. Ayman said, once you reduce them, you notice something. You notice that these are only the paths that are connected. You don't have to think of walks anymore. You don't have to deal with the number of walks. You only have to deal with whether a walk exists or not. And if a walk exists, then a path exists. And that's how you can get to the state. I want to use the term isomorphism What do you mean by isomorphism? Here, this would be graph isomorphism. So for, ex for example, if I have this graph here, I got this value 